Well, first and foremost, thanks for the invite. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. I hear the IU campus is lovely this time of year, maybe a little bit warmer than University of Wyoming. You can say that about most places, I think. Um, I, I wanted to say thanks to all the CAV organizers, everybody that put in the work to put this together. This is a fascinating subject matter for me. So I want to give you my caveat up front. I don't really speak this language uh, fluently uh, very <laughs> or very minimally, but um, but I, I'm, I'm presenting more as a, as a user of a, of a stakeholder of a person that has used um, 3D technology. Oh, EJ told me to hold on. I'm holding on. Oh, all right. Got another email from EJ. All working great. Okay. I don't know how much you, you caught of what I was just saying, but um, I'll go back to my caveat statement. So I, I'm not a I'm not a fluent um, speaker or understander of the subject matter and 3D technology, but I'm presenting in the in the realm of a of a user, of a customer, a stakeholder, um, and I've got a few examples. I was going to tell a little bit of a story about how, in the world of planning, construction, design, program programmatic development for a new space, uh, give a little history on kind of the, the introduction of 3D technology in drawing development and plan development, et cetera. Um, and then I was gonna kind of tie that into the story of how our, uh, our the Shell 3D Visual Visualization Center at the University of Wyoming, I got an invitation. I don't even remember how it all came together. I think EJ reached out to me because she's pretty good at that sort of thing um, and said, hey, here's what we can do to help help visualize your projects, help put your projects into uh, <laughs> into a little bit more real world view. Everybody sort of the cave, it was like this dark magic that uh, existed. Nobody really knew what went on in there. Um, turns out there's like 100,000 practical uses for it, for virtual reality, for <laughs> three dimensional uh, applications. But I'll go back to um, the late 90s. So and I don't know, I can't, I can't see anybody or a show of hands or anything like that, but I don't, I don't know if anybody's even got much interest in the world of, of design and construction management. That's kind of what I do. That's, that's my, my professional focus and kind of a personal interest too. But um, I've got to see this develop over the last 20 years. And so in the late 90s, the, the idea of seeing anything in a in drawing development is what it's called for construction. See, seeing anything in a three-dimensional axis was pretty much unheard of. It didn't. It didn't happen. Um, there was there was some early technological software. Oops. I'm getting a text message from EJ. Hold on. Oh, she's asking if I have any slides. I don't have slides. I'm old school. Sorry, guys. I don't have any pictures. I'm not going to do it. You're just going to have to listen to me ramble on here. Um, and if, I think this, this appears to be a very organized scenario. So I would think that if uh, you guys have any questions, want to see some drawings, want to see some of these illustrations that I'm going to give in, in uh, plan view or through file sharing or PDFs or whatever, I can send those to you too. You should have all my contact information. But um, anyway, so late 90s, there, the, there was this, this revolutionary new software called Revit, which took AutoCAD, basically plan view, two-dimensional drawings. It's basically just shows length, width, openings, etc. Oh, I can see myself bigger now. That's kind of cool. Um, and there was a bunch of different, pretty rudimentary three-dimensional models that you could employ. They weren't dimensional. You couldn't add any, you couldn't add any shape, you couldn't add any dimension. They were really Kind of an artistic version of what you thought a building might look like right again late 90s so turn of the century the early 2000s happened this this primitive software called revit is sold to autodesk and you know, they do they, they refine it they do a better job in pushing it out to the consultants and designers and professional users and all of a sudden the the hybridization of what you can see in AutoCAD, two-dimensional, some of these very primitive, very elementary versions of three-dimensional modeling 
are combined right into what's now being considered a building model and so the model is it's, it's truly that it's go back to your uh, childhood when you build something out of LinkedIn logs it's literally a model and it literally shows every component of the building from foundation systems from subterranean concrete plumbing drain waste vent all the way up through duct work for supply and return for heating to outlet locations to light fixture type and you can even put now it's it's been more and more refined over the years but you can put furniture into it you can you can lay it out in a way that projects what the building will look like um and this again there's been multiple versions of revit so we're, we're moving on from the early 2000s so by about 2007 2008 any any commercial project that's got a that's got a good designer right a good architect a reputable architect with some experience they've transitioned they've made the transition nobody's using autocad anymore everybody's doing it in revit everybody's building a model and that's not just the designers that's all of a sudden your engineers your mechanical engineer electrical engineer everybody everybody's using revit so that they can pull their model in and put all of the building systems together right super cool so by 2010 2011 if you're not using revit you're not getting any of your design work nobody your, your phones are not ringing and you're not going you're not going to build something because this is now becoming the industry standard it's expected that this is what is used um all good and fine this is great this, this really works well for the people who are getting paid to design a building this is kind of the really long whip to the <laughs> the tie into my story of, of 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 where it applies to this audience that i'm speaking here today to but your architects are using this your your engineers are using this and it's great so the 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 revit is the software the acronym that kind of describes um the construction of this the early construction of these models is bam it's building information modeling and so everybody that's getting paid to, to construct a building or to design a building for construction is using this information. So, and they call it a clash detection, which was one of the biggest reasons that Revit was popular. So all of a sudden, do I have a, do I have a vent penetrating a concrete slab where there's rebar, right? Something simple, something simple like that. If it's a hot water heat in a building, um, do I have enough space in the corridor ceiling for a 12 by 24 air duct and then two eight inch, you know, a hot and cold water pipes. And then will the valves work before the drop ceiling? Um, really cool stuff is it's a, it's a great way to, it's a change management tool, right? So if you design it right, you lay it out right. Um, the, the change order is in the field. It, it costs more to make corrections when the project's under construction than it does to make corrections in the drawing development scenario. Um, and, but the, the thing that's, that's missing here in this whole Revit, this, this whole technological advancement in drawing development is that everybody that's doing this work, they, they understand when they're looking at a set of construction drawings, they understand what they're seeing in plan view. They understand what they're looking at in elevations or building sections. It all makes sense to them. It's all, it's all more tangible. They can visualize it in 3d because that's their job, right? That's what they do. Um, but when we get into, here's and where I realized the true benefit in, in virtual reality uh, for construction planning is that when you get into an academic environment, that's, that's the theater in which I'm working right now, your, your audience, your, your stakeholders are people that they understand their program. They understand what they're doing. If they're a, if they're a researcher, if they're an instructor, if they're um, lecturing in an active learning classroom, if they're simulating offshore drilling, whatever the case may be, they know how to do that and they understand how it fits in their current physical space, right? It works great. From here to here, this lays out right, I could use a little bit more space over here. But you, the, when, you're, when you're starting a program, when you're starting a, a, a new project, a new construction project, the very early, they call it schematic development. And if you guys are familiar with all this terminology, I'm just breaking it down to a little more backstory on some of the acronyms and names. But the schematic design is where 
the design team, the architect gets together with the users and says, tell me what you want to do, right? They, it's sometimes it's pretty old school. They have Venn diagrams, circular reference. They just draw arrows on a piece of paper. Sometimes they're putting it into a laptop and laying it out a little bit more spatially. But at the end of the day, they're trying to understand from this user how big a space they need, what are the what are the dependent relationships on how things are laid out? It doesn't make sense to have your sink out across the room from a autoclave glass washer, et cetera. There's there's certain logical relationships in a building, and then the design team is entrusted to take all this information, put it into a model, put it back in a two dimensional picture, and say, Mr. Researcher, Mr. Instructor, Mr. Maintenance Manager, or Mrs. Whoever it is. Take a look at this. Take a look at this two-dimensional sketch, and tell me: Are we good? Are you, is is this going to work for you? Um, and hi, historically, that the answer is always: It looks okay, right? That seems okay. It looks like the way you've got it drawn. I'm not really sure. It'd be nice if uh, if I could. If, I, if it was a little bit more tangible for me, right? But um, that option's not often there for anybody that's uh, give, you know depending on what what your what your resources are or what your what your construction budget is the ability to walk through a building just doesn't exist um ej approached me a little over a year ago i guess i think this was this was when we were designing a new 170,000 square foot five story it's called a science initiative building it's a big um, multi-disciplinary research building with a i think it'll be the largest active learning classroom in the Rocky Mountain West. It's a pretty cool building, but um, same thing happened. So we had had a year of schematic development done for this building, right, with all the users involved, and there were still some unanswered questions, questions about collaboration space, questions about this corridor around the labs, questions about how big is this active learning classroom, what's our pre-function space look like, and um, we took and so the schematic drawings are, they're pretty rudimentary, right? You're not gonna see these, these models, these Revit models are only as, as valuable in three dimension as, as the detail level that's in them. Schematic design is, is pretty rudimentary. Design development is the next step. And then the construction drawings are, are complete. So that's gonna show layers, textures, finishes, fixtures, furniture, if you've got that in the model, landscaping, et cetera. Um, but we took, I think it was five or six users, um, researchers, I think the, the president of, or the VP of Economic Development, a few of the people that were key stakeholders in this building and um, our, the Shell, VD, Shell 3D Center, put this, put this into a model, got the headsets out and we answered and the, the specifics escaped me a little bit. There were several questions, but we answered every question in about 20 minutes, right? We've got enough collaboration space. A six foot corridor really doesn't feel confined when you're walking through it. At the top of these stairs, you do actually have a sight line to the coffee bar. The things that sound kind of little, but these were unanswered, unanswered questions for people that are gonna spend a lot of time in this building. It brought closure to something that could otherwise take weeks to, to solve, to do sketch ups, to, to try to put it in a more, you know, tangible, palatable way for people to understand how the building functions. Um, that was, that, that's one example, but I feel like, you know, for 20 years, we've been using three-dimensional technology. Cool, two minutes up, this is perfect. Thanks, EJ. I'm gonna wrap it up. But for 20 years, we've been using the construction and design team has been using three-dimensional technology to design buildings to take to act as a translator almost act as an interpreter for people who are going to occupy these buildings and they're saying we understand it we're going to put it in 2d and you're going to have to trust us but the the use of virtual reality in this type of programming and planning early is is it is an underutilized asset and it's it's something that i feel like is one of the most practical tools to avoid future changes in the construction project. If people can walk through the building and see it and understand and visualize, literally, 
how their program is going to work in a space, you can get that sign off on it that says, I'm good. There will be no changes. Construction management is all about change management. That's, that's, that's the biggest thing for budget, schedule, and scope. Um, this is a tool that works. That's my little monologue, guys. I think if anybody's got any questions, I'm not really sure if I can hear you or not, but type it or something like that. But again, thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to present and uh, make my pitch on how what your, the, the, what your subject matter is, which is fantastic. I think it's underutilized greatly in this scope. I can see you and I can hear you. Oh, we're golden. Oh, you can hear us. Great. Okay. Sure. Um, the, 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 the. There was just one. I have one quick question, if I may. I know we're a minute or two over. Uh, my question is, Sam, not to put you on the spot at all, but I am. Um, how are you going to get this into your workflow on a more permanent basis, do you think? You know, EJ, I, I appreciate that question, and that's something that's been on my radar for quite some time. Um, I feel like I, had, I, I gave a kind of a very quick illustration of the drawing development step, schematic, des schematic design, design development, construction drawings. Um, we had actually, we've spoken internally, and this is probably something I should invite you to some of these conversations because you know what you're talking about, but we've actually, in our, in our shop, we've spoken internally about having our, our contract, we contract directly with the architect who hires all the sub consultants, but having our contract, our agreement with the design team specific to state that at the end of the schematic development process, we need to collaborate to get that model into the, into the shell 3D visualization center for people to walk through before it goes to de design development. Because those are, those are the biggest breaks, right? Between schematic development and design development really easy to make changes. From design development to construction drawings, you've got a lot more input mechanically into it. So it, it just feels like it's something we just need to take action on and formalize in some way, shape or form EJ. But um, we, we, we spoke about it and I think that that's where it takes place. It takes place early towards the end of schematic development to where all these masses and shapes are so easy to manipulate and, and very, they're not cost limited to manipulate at that point. The further along your design gets, the more expensive it gets. So we just need to talk more. Splendid, thank you. We will. Any more questions? <laughs> okay. Well, hey, is that Kyle in the front row? Hey, Kyle. Looking good, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Sam. Much appreciated. All right, guys. Appreciate y'all.